Welcome to the LRB podcast. My name is Seamus Perry, and I teach English literature at the University of Oxford, and I'm a contributor to the London Review of Books. And I'm talking to Mark Ford, who is a professor of English at University College London, also a contributor to the LRB, uh, and also a poet. This is the second in a series of conversations about literary figures who have uh, appeared as subjects in the London Review of Books. Our first uh, subject was Philip Larkin, uh, and today we're talking about an earlier poet, and indeed an influence upon Larkin, W.H. Auden. So perhaps a place to start, Mark, would be to say something about Auden's origins, his, his background, and, uh, and his, where he came from. There's something particularly uh, English, I think, about Auden and ways in which his poetry connects with the English landscape. And though he moved to America later, I think that, that um, his Englishness is vital. And it's a particular kind of Englishness. It's a provincial Englishness. He was born in York, but his um, parents moved to Birmingham uh, the following year. He was born in 1907 and they moved in uh, 1908. His father was a um, medical officer um, for uh, Birmingham schools. And Auden grew up in, I suppose, what we'd call an upper upper middle class um, environment. Um, And a lot of, I think it's worth remembering, a lot of his forebears were in the church. There's something, uh, can be something which seems a bit preachy or didactic about Auden's um, poetry. And I think if you think of him in a pulpit and think of his forebears in a pulpit, that makes um, a great deal of sense. And someone like Stephen Spender has commented on the extent to which Auden liked to feel in control of his material and to deliver it uh, with a, in a somewhat seemingly didactic um, mode. Um, so the, the extent to which his ancestors belonged to the kind of clerical tradition, I think, is worth pointing out. But he was also very interested in science. Uh, and um, particularly interested in in mining and engineering. And he talks very often of how the early landscapes of his youth were essential to uh, creating a sense of mystery and magic uh, in landscape and that they recur not only in these very influential early poems, but even in late poems. He's always harking back to the disused mines of the kind of Pennine region. Yes, Auden himself uh, speaks in several places, doesn't he, about the oddity of his parents' match, because his mother represents that churchy interest that you've just been talking about, which is very high church Anglican. And his father was a psychiatrist uh, and and had um, shelves of books about psychiatry and started that whole interest that... Auden has throughout his life in ideas of the of the clinical mental analysis and, and clinical psychiatric analysis. Yes, and his, his father's essays were influential on his own ideas. There, you can trace links between uh, essays of his father's and um, Auden's own attempt to diagnose. And he did love diagnosing, um, and that sort of derived from his father. But the artistic side especially the love of music, would have derived from his mother's side. They used to play uh, Wagner duets together. Uh, And uh, he um, uh, was very close to his mother. And uh, that parental relationship was, I think, probably more vexed than the one he had with his father. He he travelled with his father to Germany and got on with his father in a fairly straightforward way. But I think his relationship to his mother was more complex and might have had more to do with his becoming a poet, uh, especially one interested in psychiatric oddities uh, than his relationship with his father. I'm sure that's right. And and certainly he attributed uh, large amounts of his adult personality to his relationship with his mother, not least his sexuality, didn't he? Well, I think that is is a key thing about Auden was that he was gay and and he was um, at a time when it wasn't um, not as difficult as it became in the 50s to be gay, but uh, his homosexuality was something that set him apart. I suppose the other crucial aspect of his upbringing which affects his poetry from beginning to end is that he went to public boarding schools Mm. (laughs) Uh, and uh, he's often said later in life that he understood how a totalitarian regime worked because he'd been to a boarding school Uh, and even in a poem like a long poem like The Orators, which is a kind of revolutionary poem, there's also a sense in which it's all it's 
uh, uh, an exposition of what happens in officer training corps yes. at a boarding school um, in the 1920s. Yes, the school was Gresham School in Holt, which I'm sure these days is an impeccably liberal establishment, but in those days does seem to have been um, a rather um, strange uh, at- atmosphere of, of discipline pervaded the whole thing with what they called the honour code, uh, which was the invention of a, of a particularly um, influential headmaster. Um, uh, he didn't like school much, did he? But the great thing about Gresham's, I suppose, is it gave him a scientific education, wasn't it? That's one of the things that characterised the school. You didn't do classics and a, and a, and a traditional education like that. You did, you, did a, you did the sciences, the natural sciences. And it was with a scholarship in the natural sciences, wasn't it, that he went up to Christchurch uh, in Oxford to become an undergraduate. Yes, uh, just a couple of things more about his schooling, I think, worth remembering. One is that he met Christopher Isherwood, uh, even at, uh, at a prep school, they were at prep school together. There's a photo of them, uh, Auden at the feet of the head of the mistress and an Isherwood behind, and they already look a mischievous pair. Uh, and when he was at Gresham's, he played Caliban in The Tempest, uh, and he rather identified with Caliban in some ways, more than with Prospero. We don't identified with Prospero, Ariel, and Caliban at different mm. uh, in different ways. Mm. But the sense of being an outsider, um, someone who was anti-establishment, someone resistant to authority and institutions, uh, and that remained with him all his life. His um, you could call his life overall a rather bohemian one. He didn't um, bed himself down into any institution. He didn't become part of. Uh, the establishment. Uh, he lived, uh, to some people, it was a very slovenly existence, but it was could be seen as a bohemian existence mm-hmm. and one consonant with that sense of being in opposition to the um, those in power. I think another, another crucial thing from his schooling is when in 1922, Robert Medley, his friend said, have you ever thought of being a poet, Auden? <laughs> and Auden replied, Medley, I'm not... <laughs> That's exactly what I'm going to be. Um, and he decided there and then. It was then, the first time it had struck him, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. It never, never occurred to him. Yes, uh, yes. So he was, what, 15 at, at this yeah. time. Um, and he decided there and then not just to become a poet, but to become a great poet. And extraordinarily for an undergraduate, he, he did write great poems while he was still uh, um, in his very, very early 20s, or, or 20, in fact. Yes. So shall we have a, a, a quick look at one of those? So... So he publishes a volume called Poems in 1930, and before that, T.S. Eliot has published a verse play that he's written called Paid on Both Sides in his journal called The Criterion. So this is this is a very striking debut, isn't it? He's, he's very young, and he's been taken up by what is by far the most important publisher of contemporary poetry in England. Yes, and I think his poetry becomes good at the moment that his early saturation in the works of Thomas Hardy, he said he wrote nothing but Thomas Hardy for two and a half years, Thomas Hardy's poetry, and Edward Thomas and Wilfred Owen and the English tradition. That saturation received this kind of electric jolt in 1926 when he read The Wasteland four years after it was published. And I think the meeting of this English tradition with high modernism uh, as as exemplified by The Wasteland was what con- completely Auden at a very young age as a poet. So he could write um, the most astonishingly assured, authoritative, convincing, original verse when he was still um, 20, 21 uh, and an undergraduate at Oxford. So the poem that when it appears in, in the volume Poems just has a, in a very chaste way a, a, a Roman numeral as its title, but is later titled by Auden The Secret Agent. Uh, it's a very good example of that early voice, don't you think? Um, uh, the first few lines, control of the passes was, he saw, the key to this new district. But who would get it? He, the trained spy, had walked into the trap for a bogus guide, seduced with the old tricks. Um, how would you how would you characterise that sort of voice? I mean, there's nothing like it before, is there? There's nothing like it. I think one of the key factors in its um, mesmerising power is its indeterminacy, that you're not exactly sure who he is, what the key is, what the passes are, whether they're uh, passes as in some frontier district or they're passes as in some kind of sexual um, uh, uh, advance to someone, um, that th- there's a, a kind of mystery about the lines. Uh, and it, But it ties in as well with a sense of menace, of threat, of some kind of obscure crisis which is uh, overhanging the protagonist who is somehow 
somehow an every person. Um, he's a trained spy, but he's one who has failed. He's been seduced by the old tricks. And that sense of failure, which is dominant in, in Auden's poems, um, struck the, his early readers as um, particularly um, uh, important, that it connected with the zeitgeist. And my own sense of, of one reason for that is that Auden can be seen as one of the first, or perhaps the first post-imperial poet, that the England um, or the, uh, the England that he describes is one which is uh, losing at this point, that the empire is collapsing and the machinery is rusting and the industry is comatose and so on. And its spies are unsuccessful in their whatever battles they are facing with yes. spies on the other side. Thanks for listening to this extract from series one of Modernish Poets. To listen to the full series and to all our other close reading series, sign up at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link below.